but I would say too, these fish have been in the Keys now for a while in the Caribbean. So, I mean, just in our marina, when we're flaying them, like the manatees are eating them, yeah. which is inter- interesting. So the weird, isn't eating it? Them. Yeah, they just gnaw on them, you know? So, and then I've, I have noticed too, we, we mainly dive on the reef now. We used to dive a lot of little wrecks and stuff, but as Goliath groupers really come back, I mean, there's, I don't think that there's any official evidence of this, but we've, I've seen a huge correlation between those larger uh, groupers, like where we see like Goliath groupers or large black groupers on a spot. Um, we don't see a lot of lionfish there. And then when we go to a spot that doesn't have any Goliath groupers, we see a lot of lionfish. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, Saltwater underscore Experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now, let's get on to today's show. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony Young, and this is the Tom Rellum Podcast. Tony, what's going on? How are you? Man, I'm doing awesome. It's good to be back. It's good to see you. Everything's I know. going good down here. Yeah. Yeah. What about yourself? Oh man, things have things have been going great. Um, everything's everything's been going great. I'm anxious to to talk to you about spear fishing and and what you've been up to. Yep. Um, have you been? Has it been good lately for you? Yeah, we've had an interesting transition into the wintertime pelagic. The water temp stayed warm for quite a while and it's just starting to get into that like 78, 79 degree. Mm -hmm. So I feel like our, our grouper, you know, closes December 31st, but we've had a really strong finish to grouper and, uh, the pelagics have started to roll in. So it's been a really fun time the last couple of weeks in the keys for sure. Yeah. What's your favorite time for, for Wahoo? Um, well, it, it kind of different for the keys. I like the, uh, spring months the best for uh-huh. us in the upper keys. And then if you're down in the lower keys, uh, the fall months, I, I believe huh. are the best down there. Now with, with such, uh, I mean, it's really not that far. What would sep- mm-hmm. what would be the difference between the spring and fall in, in such a short, uh, distance? I mean, you're only talking about a hundred, hundred miles apart. Um, what, what makes the difference there? Um, I guess kind of just, that's just seems what the runs do. We get a nice early run, like in September, we'll get like that first moon. It'll be really good. And then we just don't get like, we get good fish in the upper keys, but it seems like the larger number of schools really start popping up in the springtime. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the water's a little bit cooler. We've gotten more of our fronts coming through at that point. So I think that has a big play with it. Just like, but overall, it just seems like the springtime for us has kind of been the best time up here. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And uh, one thing I saw uh, recently, did you just run a marathon? Yeah. Yep, you did? I just did one last weekend. And, and was that your first one that you've ever done? Yes, that was the first one. That's yep. awesome. Uh, I paid and, particular attention to it because my son and his fiance and my daughter and her boyfriend all signed up for a marathon on the same weekend that you did yours. It wasn't the same marathon. They oh, were really? they were in Jacksonville. Yeah. Uh, they did yeah. the Jacksonville marathon. But the, tell me about the one that you did. 
Well, it's kind of a funny story because I never really saw myself as a runner and I just kind of got into this last year. So I've been putting in for elk tags in Wyoming for the past few years. And when I drew my tag, I was like, okay, like it's, <laughs> it's time, it's time to get ready. Like where we're going to be hunting is, you know, I need to get, uh, I'm in shape, but like really need to get the cardio up for the altitude and stuff. So I started running and then a friend of mine, he's like, Hey, you should do this marathon with me. I'm like, okay, you know, kind of committed to it with not really thinking about it. And all of a sudden it was coming up. So um, yeah, I mean, before the marathon, I hadn't really done a longer run than seven miles. So wow. it was, it was quite the task, but it was a blast. I'm definitely hooked on it for sure. Wow. That's awesome. So yeah. that was a similar story to uh, my daughter's boyfriend, Braden. They trained for the half. And in this particular one that they ran, uh, the five K they had a five K a half and a full and the five K, the half and the full were the same course until eight miles. And, uh, well, the five K peeled off, you know, but uh, yep. at eight miles, you, you kind of, the half marathon peeled off one way, the full marathon kept going and he decided, I think I'm just going to do the full. And so he just jumped oh, in wow. and the same with you, the longest run he had yep. ever done before that was seven or nine miles. I mean, not, yep. not much. And and then he, he finished nicely. It was, it was yeah. worked out nicely. Um, how does legs feel afterwards? Yeah, everybody was hobbling around uh, oh, you know, yeah. the next day. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, 26 miles running. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. I've done, done quite a few marathons myself. It's been a while, but, uh, yeah, I was pretty sore. I remember that yeah. I was super sore after, yeah. after doing them. Um, so you think you'll do another one? Oh yeah. I'm hooked. It was a, it was a phenomenal experience. I really enjoyed it. Like my grandfather is a big runner. So I think maybe it's in the family a little bit. Yeah. And I felt like, I mean, runner's high must be a thing. Cause I just felt invincible at like yeah. mile 17, Right. you know, like mile 17 to like 20 just felt like on top of the world, light as a feather. And then like the last couple of miles I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it was, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, there's, I mean, so many people involved with it. It's a whole industry that I had never been exposed to before. So yeah. I love I'm race day, another- man. And, and I got yeah. just a little, you know, I used to do those races myself and then to go back and, and do it. Um, I was just kind of watching the kids and supporting them. And we, we drove around the course and met them at these different places. And, and it was really fun, but the atmosphere at, at one of those races is it's, it's hard to even describe to somebody that's never seen it or, or been in one, but it's an overwhelmingly, incredibly positive atmosphere. Everybody's cheering you on. Mm-hmm. Everybody's happy you're there. And, and it, there's so much excitement. I just, I just love that so much. And it was cool this time to, to see a different side of the race. I, I was, I've always, I've never watched one like that. And, uh, to be in it is a whole different experience, you know? Yeah. Sorry about the pump there. The UPS guy just, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So what, um, when you decided you were going to do it, did you have a plan or did you, um, did you just jump in and just start running some and hope for the um, best or well, what? Yeah. So I guess I kind of got, I, well, I'm like, okay, I got to hold myself accountable because I told my buddy I'd do it. So I just started telling friends I was going to do it. You kind of hold yourself accountable that yeah. way, you know? And, um, so my, I was just trying to run just about every day after, after work diving and fishing. So, you know, your body's already kind of tossed around and tired. So I would just try to get three to five miles in four to five days a week, six days a week. And, um, you know, never really had the time or to do more than that. Um, but after doing the marathon, I definitely appreciate the work that goes in for people that are doing like 13 to 16 plus mile runs to train for it, you know? Yeah. But it's hard to do. It's hard to balance that with a, with a fishing schedule. It really is. Um, did you have trouble with that? Like, I mean, you, you know, it's a Um, full day and fishing is, you know, especially what you're doing offshore and diving and all that. It's very physical anyway. And then, you know, you get home and you run, run a little bit. Was that challenging for you or did you, did it start to kind of even out a little bit? Well, I tried doing it in the morning, you know, big follower, Cameron Haynes, a lot of my bow hunting guys that I love to follow. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna be like Cameron. I wake up two 30 in the morning, run for an hour and a half before I got the book, get to get down to the boat. And I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> it's like so early. So, I mean, my normal day starts about four go get the boat ready, do all that. Um, so my thing was as long as, as soon as I got done with the boat and got home, I'd pretty much like just take the dog for a walk and then just start running immediately before I got too tired in the evening. But, uh, the hard thing was that's when it's real hot down here in the keys, you know, that's like, you know, that five o'clock time period. 
Um, but it actually became like a really nice break in the day, which you can appreciate too. It's, you know, you put the headphones in, catch up on some podcasts, listen to your podcast a lot. Nice. And it's just like, it became a nice piece in my day. So actually, you know, after a couple of weeks, you almost start craving a run after you get down the water. I know it's yeah. hard to imagine that when you're first starting that that's, that's, that's where you'll end up. But, um, I, I did the same thing. And what my, my trick was, uh, the, the biggest challenge for me after fishing on the skiff all day in Key West, I would come back and if I stepped foot into the house in the air conditioning, there was a real good chance yeah. that I wasn't coming back out. Yeah. And so I would yeah. keep my running shoes um, in the truck and yeah, that's I would just change clothes and just go before I ever walked in the house because, man, the feeling of that air conditioning after you've been outside all day fishing in the, in August or something – Woo. Yep. I mean, you hit that yep. AC and it is hard, hard, hard to go back out oh, yeah. into a, a you run. You got to keep the shirt wet. Yeah. On yep. the sur- <laughs> it's like you're running on the surface of the sun anyway. But uh, I've really enjoyed the the marathon training and, and uh, it was it was really, you know, it, it really transferred over to lots of other parts of my life of just, you know, preparation and discipline and um, you know, when you're tired, a lot of times you feel like all I want to do is lay down, but actually if you go for a run or you get some exercise, you seem to have more energy. Um, right. that was, that was all really, really great for me. And I was doing it when my kids were little and I had like uh, a double jogging stroller. I used to take the boys. It was a good time, you know, to spend, spend time with them. And I don't know, I have very fond memories of the, of the marathons and stuff. So it was cool to watch you. Uh, do that, oh, see yeah. that, see you do that and see my kids getting involved in that right now. It's very cool. Yep. Well, and I got the, I got the missus involved too. So that's always nice. So she'll, she'll run a mile or two with me most uh-huh. days. And so she's, so we're going to do the seven mile bridge run down here in the keys, which oh, that's a great, well, as long as we get in, you know, right. You got to get, gonna, that yeah. is a, I've run that race a couple of times and most of the time I've, 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 I've tried to run the, <clears throat> the race a few more times and did not get in. It's hard to get in. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Yeah. It's really hard to get in, but that is, that's one of the coolest races. I, I love that yeah. one. That is really great to run across that bridge. And then every time I drive across that bridge, I just can't, you know, I've got it in the back of my mind. It's like, man, I ran across this thing one day and, yeah. uh, and, and it's, it's good. You know, the way they have that set up is, uh, it's better for the lower keys people, I think, than it is for the upper keys people, because you yeah. finish, and you go home where the upper keys people you finish and then you have to wait for them to open the bridge again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. we, I kept a car on the, on the, on the downstream side. Uh, so we were finished and just, just kept going, but you know, they, well, it's the key. So there's probably some beers waiting for you. Oh, there's the some too, beers, I'm sure. for yeah, sure. Yeah. There, there definitely are. There definitely are. That's a, that's a great race though. And, um, and then they've got those Ragnar races in the keys now where it's like a relay all the way down the keys. Those are fun. Yeah, a couple too. of friends do that. Yeah. I was going to say, so the next step is for us is we got to do the keys 100. Oh yeah. <laughs> Can you wow. imagine that? Um, well, so. that's what my son is trying to do right now. He is, you know, this marathon was the first step in, in really, um, and it was almost like a training run for him because his goal is to try to do one of these 100 mile races. So he's got, yep. he did the marathon. And then the next thing is this 50 K mountain race, which is roughly a little more than 30 miles, I guess. And then, then the next thing would be the the 100 that he's trying to do. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I never did that. And I don't, yeah. uh, that's running 26 miles or 30 miles. That's a long way, but a hundred, it is, that's that's pretty far, two, but you know, two, I mean, people show you that people show you that it's possible every single day. I mean, that whole ultra, um, the ultra racing community and you know what you can see on, on Instagram and with people like David Goggins and Cameron Haynes and, and all of oh, those yeah. guys. And then, then if you start following those guys and then, you know, some of the other people they mention, you, you just start to learn that there's this whole world of people that run a hundred miles. Like, Lots yep. of them. And it's totally yep. possible. Now, yep. it seems very well, challenging, but it is totally possible. Well, and that's what was really exciting for me. Like you said, race day, I was like, man, there is like, I knew that it was an industry and it was a thing that a lot of people do it, but then to be there and there's like thousand plus people lined up to run, it's a little intimidating. And then it's like, man, everybody is extremely 
you know, nice and excited. Everybody's got signs. All the people at the aid stations are phenomenal. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, I can't even imagine when you get further into the industry, like how, how much you'd have in common with all the people. Yeah. It's but, really cool. When I ran mm-hmm. my first marathon, I think I had read somewhere. Somebody said, you know, if you really want to have a great experience, wear a shirt with your name on it. And, you know, you just oh, you a have a shirt, it's Tony, you know, it just says Tony <laughs> yeah. across there and everybody yeah. that you pass is go Tony, go Tony, you know, yeah. and, and it just, it really does give you an extra boost and, and they're looking for some, something to say to you, you know, it's like, good job. Good job. They can only say that so many times. And if you've got some kind of identifying thing on your, on your, yep. your shirt or your shorts or whatever, they will call you by that. And, uh, it's, it's really cool when that happens, but the, oh, yeah. you know, the volunteers at those things, they are really, truly amazing. Um, when you see one of these big races that, that gets put on, um, that's cool. So tell me about the elk hunting. Have you ever done that before? No, this is my first elk trip. Okay. So I have been, it's been on my radar for a long time. And I mean, I guess that's every bow hunter's dream, right? Is to be able to go on an elk hunt. So I've definitely been working towards it and put in for a few years. I did not expect to draw tags this year. And when, when I drew, I got goosebumps thinking about (laughs) it now. I mean, it it was just, I mean, absolute one of the best experiences of my life to be in public land, Wyoming, like staring, there's no sign of human anywhere. And you're just like, this is all of our land that's protected here. And to be able to hunt those animals, it was just phenomenal. So you already I did mean, it. Yeah. This September. Oh, awesome. Yeah, this past September. Yeah. So that was the whole thing with the marathon is I'm like, okay, I got the elk hunt coming up. My buddy wants to do a marathon. I'm just going to, you know, buckle down. And I'm like, okay, I'm training for the marathon. And that was my way to like, get, get yeah. the energy to like, keep going. For, Cause I mean, for a while I'd go work and then run four or five miles and then come home, shoot my bow, do a couple air, a couple hundred arrows and like just that repetition every day. And it's like, you know, but it, it paid off. I mean, the trip was just phenomenal. I can't, I'm hooked beyond hooked. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you had success. Yeah. That's yeah. phenomenal. So I, yeah. It was, I mean, everybody said it's like you're hunting Wyoming, it's public land, you know, like any bull is a good bull. And I'm like, well, I want to, be able to take a bull that's had the opportunity to live its life here, reproduce, you know, that would be, and I'm like, whether it's the first day or the, I'm not going to pass up something on the first day. I won it on the last. And literally the first morning, uh, we were looking at the, I was looking at the forecast with the guides and we knew it was going to be good. And we, it was like the first morning I shot my bull nice. and then, uh, the whole rest of the week was pretty good. But that first morning was definitely like our best that we had. Um, I mean, it was a phenomenal hunt. Just, so much fun. And, That's so and then we, cool. we spent the rest of the week trying to get my buddy, his bull. And unfortunately he didn't get one. He did have a, he did have a chance, mm-hmm. um, and just shot a little high. So kind of missed him. But, uh, I mean, just like he was shooting my bow because a moose scared our, <laughs> scared our horses. And one of the mares went back and like bumped into his horse and just oh, it bent his man. riser on his bow and blew his sight off. So he was shooting my bow, which he's a lot taller. So it's, you know, he was having a hard time finding his anchor point. I felt terrible when that elk came in for him, but I mean, it was just awesome, which I'm sure you can relate. So, well, I, I can, but I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a white belt elk hunter myself. My boys both go to Montana yeah. state and they're in Bozeman and, um, and they are far more into it than, than I am, but they've gotten me involved in the first couple of times that I went, I would just went as support, like, um, just helping them, and I didn't even have a bow or carry a bow or anything. It was just like, if we get one, I'll help carry it out. And you know, it's you're in grizzly country and the more of you, the better. And, uh, so yeah. I went a couple of times, uh, and loved it without even having a bow, yeah. loved it. Yeah. And then last year I decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this the right way. And so I got a bow from a bow shop out, out there that was set up for elk and everything. And then I shot it all year long, just like you're talking about Yep. and felt prepared, but, uh, we got one last year and then we did not, we did not get one this year. And, uh, we had, it's it's tough. It is so hard. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is so hard. And, um, that was our kind of our, um, you, you'll definitely be able to relate to this is that I came away from the elk hunt last year and I was like, man, you know what elk hunting is like? It's like every time you think it's going to get easier, 
it gets harder. It gets harder. Oh, <laughs> it yeah. does. Yeah. Because yep. like the first few days we're, we're like walking around covering so many miles. We got heavy packs. We're walking so many miles and we're not finding any animals. And then it's like, man, once we, once we locate them, this is going to get easier because we're going to be able to go right to where they are. And we're not going to have to cover all the, you know, we're not going to have to go 20 miles that we'll know where they are. We'll just go straight there. Well, you go straight there, but they are there, but they're at the top of the mountain. And it's like, okay, now, yep. now we're going up there. Okay. This just got harder. And, uh, then, then I kept thinking, well, man, when we kill one, you know, it'll, it'll get easier. Well, it got harder. No, it gets now it's harder. time to carry it out. <laughs> and man, that, that deal, both my boys were with us, with us, with me, um, when, you know, for a few days and then my, my middle son had to go back to school. And so it was just me and my older son when he actually killed one. And so it was just me and him that had to pack it out. we were like, man, I wish Hayden had to go back to school. We could use an extra hand here. Um, but what a great experience. I mean, just, just, you know, the whole thing is just, it's just fantastic. You have to be in really good shape. You have to have practiced all this practice with a bow and, and getting dialed in and just practice over and over and over in all different conditions and everything. I just, I just loved that part of it so much. It's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It was phenomenal. I, I, I'm trying to do another one and it's uh, I mean, just like getting tags to do this and setting up a trip is just, I mean, that's a whole task in its own. Yeah. You know. Oh, it, it but, certainly is. I mean, it's it's monumental yeah. just doing that. I mean, when you find yourself there, it's like, man, so much has happened to even be here right now. Oh, yeah. That's a success in itself. I wonder um as you're as you're kind of how how much bow hunting had you done before before the elk um trip? Yeah, so well, when I was a kid growing up in Minnesota, I was introduced to it when I was like, I mean, I got photos of my grandpa and me shooting like yeah. recurves and I was like probably like five years old at elk targets, you know? And so I had shot arrows and stuff and, but I never really hunted until I guess really like the last four or five years. Mm-hmm. So, um, do a lot of whitetail hunting, but yeah, this was the first trip for elk and you know, that was part of the training, right? It's just trying to shoot as much as I can. I've shot a lot of whitetail and I've, I've spent a lot of time in the woods, but you know, going out Wyoming, got to have a guide. I'm like, I'm coming from that side of the industry as a guide. I, I just, I'm going to shoot as much as I can. I'm going to be in as good a shape as I can. Cause I don't want to let down the guides mm-hmm. or, you know, I might only, if I get one chance, that might be the only chance I get. Um, so I know how hard it is. Um, but it was, it was phenomenal, but yeah, I definitely needed a couple years of solid hunting and just time in the woods and kind of paying the price on whitetail, the waiting and the you know, trying to learn the white tail and their bed and food and moving, you know, all that process of understanding, okay, you can't just go in and kill these animals. There's a process and you have to learn how to enjoy every aspect of it, you know? Yeah. Um, I find it, um, you know, when, when I was going through this process of learning, you know, uh, all, all that you just talked about is as far as the elk goes. And I just found it very, very similar to a lot of the, the, the process and the journey that I went through, um, you know, learning, to fish in the Florida Keys, like permit fishing, particularly fly fishing for permit is very similar to, um, to bow hunting for elk, in my opinion. I mean, I just, I just drew a lot of similarities. I wonder if you yep. drew any similarities between, you know, once you're out there doing it and you're, you're, you're seeing all this and you're very high level spear fisherman. Um, did you draw any kind of similarities, uh, between the process of becoming a, a, a high level spear fisherman and, you know, where you were, you know, bow hunting for elk. Yeah. I think hunting pelagic fish, uh, of course got, you know, talking about Wahoo already, that's one of them. Um, but even more like African pompano and those, those fish were, um, when like they show up and they show up in good numbers and the conditions have to be perfect. Right. And then, and then you have to be perfect to execute it. And then to actually like, especially with an arrow on an elk, you know, like the shot has to be right. And if it's a few inches off one way or the other, you might not ever see that elk. Mm -hmm. And that's the same way with some of these larger pelagics is, is not only you have to find where the fish are you. And when you find them, then you have to be perfect in the water on your diving and your, your, the shape that you're in. And, 
um, what your weeks look like, rest, you know, your diet, all that. And then when you go to place the shot, the shot has to be perfect, you know, in order to recover the fish. Mm -hmm. And, but then on the flip side, I think that there is a fair amount of luck involved too with it too. You know, we've had a lot of times spear fishing where it's just, you just get lucky. The fish are just there. And sometimes that's with elk. Like, um, you know, on my trip, I, I felt like I had a good combination of both. I was prepared, but also the guide said, you know, we just hit, there was a lot of different pressure changes, a lot of different weather changes. The elk were going crazy in the middle of their rut. So we, you know, we planned a year almost in advance to make sure that we got the perfect week and we, we got a little lucky then too. So, but yeah, Pratt, you have to practice a lot. I mean, I'm constantly shooting my spear gun, just, you know, just at targets and stuff, just to kind of keep up on it. And you'll and, do that in the water. Like you'll, yeah, you'll be, yeah. you'll practice in the water and like yeah. in the open ocean or do you do it? Like, is there, how do most people practice spear fishing? Like you're shooting all the time. Um, at targets, like what, what would be, yes. what would you do necessarily to, to practice that for people that don't know? So it's kind of, t well, if you have a pool, obviously it's pretty, it, you know, you can shoot. So you just uh, take like a speedo board and you just tape an X on it or something, drill two holes and just put some mono with the weight on the bottom. And then, so you just levitate that speedo board in the middle of your pool about, you know, five, like two, three feet off the bottom. And you can practice your free dive, hang on the bottom for, 30 seconds, minute and a half, whatever. And, and then just practice taking those shots at that, at that board. Um, and that'll at least help you close the gap between trips. So if you're coming to the keys or a different country doing a spear fishing trip every couple months, you know, that'll help you close the gap to stay good with your gear, just like shooting targets with an arrow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, you can't hunt all the time and you actually might only shoot an arrow at an animal a couple times a year. If, if once, you know, same goes with fish. If you're, so that's, we actually have a lot of clients that come down and, um, when they're like, if they're down here, do a lot of trips with us, well, we might spend just a, like the first part of the day, just doing that in shallow water, whether nice. it's free diving or scuba, but it really pays off. Yeah, it does pay off. And you know, in the keys, we're able to, to use a full on spear gun, do, but do you also use a pole spear, um, in the keys? Um, it, it depends on the individual. So we usually, the only time that we use pole spears is when people are getting ready for a Bahamas trip. Mm. So if they, if they got like a, a day, a week in the Bahamas, then, uh, which you can only use a uh, pole spear free dive over there, of course, or Hawaiian sling. Um, so they'll book a day with us and, uh, we'll get, you know, we'll go through all their gear, make sure everything's good, get them solid on their shots. But uh, for the most part in the keys, we usually use spear guns. Mm -hmm. And when you're getting somebody ready for the, the Bahamas and you are, you know, helping them with a pole spear, is it the same process you're going to get in the pool and, and shoot a board like that? Or is there a different, different way to practice with the pole spear? No, that will. And it's, you know, when we do charters, generally we just kind of uh, just jump right into spear fish and just looking for fish. Um, the pool stuff is really good for folks that, um, like before they come down on their trip or if they're seasonal come to the keys, they have a lot of time and we might spend some time on that, but yeah, pole spear, we, we spend a lot of time in like 35, 55 feet of water, a little bit shallower. Um, and then cause the, the, if you're free diving, the hang time on the bottom is, is really going to be, it's, that's going to be the longest, right? Like trying to approach the fish and, you know, you have to get so much closer to them. Um, so we usually target like mountain snapper, mangrove snapper, um, some red grouper, stuff like that, which are a lot easier fish to shoot with a pole spear. Mm -hmm. And what about range? How do you, like when people are kind of, you know, getting into spear fishing and, you know, I, that's such a important thing in, in bow hunting is like, if you're at 40 yards or 50 yards, it's, you know, you gotta be dialed in and you, you really need to know exactly what your yardage is and everything. Uh, I'm sure that, that, you know, it's the same kind of with spearfishing. You're trying to get as close as you possibly can, obviously, but do you, do you help people with how to kind of judge the range, uh, when a fish is too far, when a fish is, you know, how to get close to a fish? What do you normally yep. uh, instruct people? How do you do that? Well, anybody listening, if you can find an under, if you can make an underwater range finder, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Wouldn't that be <laughs> cool? That be nice? Yeah, just, <laughs> that'd be sweet. But, um, so one thing we do, like if folks are really new and we're introducing spearfishing, like say it's their first time, they've only been a few times, we'll take on the boat, the guns that whether they bring with them or the guns that we have for them. And, uh, we'll just take the shaft out with the line and we'll actually walk it out to the boat. So our, one of our boats, 36 foot. So we 
we walk that shaft all the way out so they can get a visual. They'll actually hold the gun out and then they can see how far that is. Mm -hmm. Of course, everything is going to be a little closer, a little bigger underwater feeling like, but at least they can get a distance. Um, and then when they're first getting started, we always go down and they will shoot the gun at least once or twice. Um, if it's a new gun to them, like if they're using one of ours so that they can get a feel for it underwater. Mm -hmm. But, um, as you do it more, every fish reacts a little bit differently. Like mangrove snapper, even though they're smaller fish, they're just like a blast to hunt. They like, they come straight in at you and they are very curious. And then they'll like get to this point where they're just a few feet from you. will be like, I'm not sure if I should keep coming in any closer. Then they turn sideways and then they <laughs> take off. So, so like mangrove snapper, you can shoot three feet, four feet away, whereas mutton snappers keep a far distance. So, um, generally I tell is like, as soon as you can see detail in the fish, you know, when you can really start to pick out some of the details in the fish's face, you know, like a dog snapper has that teardrop or muttons have like those little blue marks, or as soon as you can really start to see the detail in the fish that, that usually indicates that you're close enough for a shot. That's so cool. What is your, uh, what's your favorite, uh, fish to, to hunt in the water? Um, I've kind of been, it kind of depends where we're at. I really enjoy hunting black grouper in the Bahamas on pole spear. Mm. Uh, the hunt there is just a ton of fun. Um, you know, you can hunt from the surface. The water there is really clear. Like our best days in the keys is like kind of how the Bahamas is a lot of the year. And I love seeing the larger grouper rock up and then being able to go down with a pole spear. Um, but in the Florida keys or South Florida, I really like hunting Wahoo in the winter. Um, and African Pompano, especially, I just think those two species are just, because they're just so hard to come across, you know, and w when you know, it's going to be good, you're like just the energy on the dock and on the boat, when you're heading out, you're like, no, you're about to get into them. You're like, it's like, it's pretty fun. What does that look like it's when, like you, race when you, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. But <laughs> when, what does it look like? Like when you wake up in the morning and you look at the weather and you look at the time of the year and the tides and everything else, what tells you, man, this is going to be a killer Wahoo day. We are going, today's the day. Like what, what is that? What would that look like to you? Well, those are the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm can't sleep and I'm scrolling through Instagram at two in the morning, that's, that's how you know, it's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> I can't ever sleep the night before. Um, well, you know, just like in the upper keys, I like the springtime and we try to, we try to go around the moon cycles, you know, the full moons are really good. Those, and, um, those fish are usually together in schools. They're more active, um, they're feeding. So they're going to be on a lot of the spots where we see the bait and stuff like that. But, you know, calm weather days are really nice. So when it, like, if it's, you know, February, March, something like that, and you got a calm day and it's close to a moon that's just a really good indication that you're going to have Wahoo. And there's like wind directions, currents, all that stuff that really helps out. But just playing the moons on the right type of month is a big deal. Um, you know, if you kind of think about Wahoo, they spend a lot of time toward the surface. So if it's real rough out, just in general, haven't seen a whole lot of them when it's rough out. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and that's always you're nice. also, I mean, you dive, but you also, you're, you're fishing a lot as well. And do you, do you see that the, the days that you get really super excited about, you know, today's probably going to be a really good day to spearfish Wahoo. Would it also be a really good day to catch Wahoo or the, are the, um, the conditions different for what's best for rod and reel and what's best for getting in the water and, and spearfishing? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's just like anything you got to, fish or spear fish when the fish are there. Yeah, so that helps. Um, I pretty, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty, so I mean, around the same times that we're seeing them, you know, I've, I've been on when I was really starting to dial in Wahoo, like five years ago, I mean, we went pretty much every condition and we just noticed trends. I mean, we just don't see the fish during certain conditions. So if we're not seeing them over diving, you're probably not going to catch them. Mm -hmm. Um, but it correlates. I mean, when we're seeing them in the water, I'm, you know, talking to other captains that are high speeding or trolling lures and stuff or live baiting and they're catching them too. Mm -hmm. But what I have noticed is where we dive and where people fish is sometimes it's a lot different with fishing. You can cover a lot more ground than we can diving. Um, it's a lot of patience, right? You know, and it's a lot of risk. If you try to, if you see a nice edge out in 400 feet of water, like that might be really nice to fish because, you know, you can high speed troll that and cover a lot of distance. So if the fit, you know, the fish might've already passed through a certain spot, but for us diving, we're just sitting there drifting, looking for them. Like people might lose patience after an hour or two of that. Yeah. So. Yeah, especially if you're not seeing them. 
All right. Like yeah, that's, when you're doing yeah. that, when you're doing that, that type of, um, of, of, you know, hunting basically is, is what it is really. And you get it like when you're down there and you're talking about the, the mangrove snapper, if you're taking people down there, you know, you might see mangrove snapper, you might see grouper, you might see hogfish, you might see, there's all kinds of different targets that you could possibly have. So if you're not seeing what you're like, if you're really after mangroves, but for whatever reason, you're not seeing very many, there might be something else that you could shoot there. Yeah. Exactly. But when you're, yep. when you're doing this Wahoo out in the open water, uh, I would imagine that there's sometimes when you're not seeing them and really you're not seeing much else either. Right. How do you keep your keep right. people, your customers like entertained or focused enough to be like, you know, I have confidence here and they're going to be here. Like we just have to yeah. stick it out a little bit. Right. But yeah. you're not, you're it's one thing when you're kind of envisioning what could possibly be under the water, uh, when you're on top of a boat and you're like, okay, patience. And maybe we'll just eat a sandwich and kill a little time here. And then the fish might show up here in a little bit. But when you're actually right. in the water and you're looking around, it's like, well, I have eyeballs and there's not, there's nothing here. <laughs> like, yeah. How do you, but you know, they're going to be there. Do you just tell them to yeah. you know, just be patient or what do you do? Well, I mean, I think people that are generally at that level of free diving, well, like for, for charters, we just don't, I try not to, I, I like taking folks that have spearfished a lot. I think like same for my elk trip, like the outfit that we chose, they interviewed us before they allowed mm. us to book. Mm -hmm. So they, we went through interview process to make sure, cause they want to be successful too with, cause they only get a couple hunts, you know, for elk a year. Right. So the same thing is, is, uh, you know, anybody that is wanting to try to shoot Wahoo that you got to pay your dudes, you got to spend some time on the reef. You got to get used to the gear because you, if you only get w w maybe one or two or three shots at them on a perfect, day. Um, you know, you got to make sure you make them count. So generally the people that are doing the Wahoo trips, they, they know the drill and they've probably done it multiple times. They've probably tried it in other countries. Maybe they've done it up down in Key West. Um, they've done it up here. So they kind of know how hard they are and they know that the payout, what the payoff is and that it's worth it. But, um, we bounce around too. So like sometimes we'll come into the wrecks and, you know, we see rainbow runners and yellow jacks and those are places that Wahoo you know, frequent through too. So that's kind of like, okay, we're kind of blue water is kind of getting kind of tired. We spent a few hours and we can come into a rack and that way they can, you know, shoot some other fish and kind of get their spirits lifted a little bit. And then we can go back, work out on an edge or something like that. Um, but it never does fail. I mean, you big amberjack comes in, they get excited, shoot it <laughs> or a yellow jack. And then the dang Wahoo swims right up. Of course. It's like, I mean, it's happened so many times because they like that energy too. They're like, Oh, what's going on? There's activity here, you know? Yeah. And that'll bring them in. But I mean, that's the same as permit fishing. You know, you get somebody down there and it's the same kind of deal. Everything's the same. You, you're, you're kind of interviewing people for this best time of the year and you want them to, to be successful, but you also want to be successful. So you want to take the right person and, and you know, the, the best, the best ones like fly fishing for permit, they won't cast at anything else. A, a school of bonefish swims yep. up and they're like, mm -hmm, I'm not casting at that. They've already done that because as soon as you yep. hook that thing, there's the permit. That's a, that's yep. exactly what happens. And that's happened to these people over and over. And they're like, I'm not doing yep. that anymore. And even if that's a, you know, I'd love to catch that bonefish, but I'm not going to, because this is the target for today. That's the guy you really, the really want. Yep. And that's the guy that's going to be successful yep. because the, you know, every, everything that you cast at, that might be, that might've been your shot, you know, yeah. um, when you're, when you're, um, what are the kind of things that you want somebody to, you know, to have like previous experience? Like if you're, you're kind of interviewing someone for, for, you know, they say, I want to go Wahoo, uh, spear and Wahoo. Like what, what kind of experience are you looking for? You know, that tells you that they're kind of the right person. They've been to other countries. They've done this a few times or, or do you have, questions that you ask because we talk about this a lot about communication before a charter and how important that is and how important it is to getting the person that's trying to book you the trip that they want by the guide asking their the right questions and making sure that you're giving them the right trip and do you have uh, do you have ways that you kind of interview these people you know in a you know in a polite way that you're you're just trying to make sure that first of all they're capable of doing what they want to do and secondly that you're going to give them the trip that they are after yeah well that's a hundred percent it and i think 
like the first part is we like the people that I like doing the Wahoo trips or just spearfishing in general, like that advanced level are folks that we've been working with for a couple of years. And maybe they went spearfishing with us for the first time. We have a ton of these folks and they've built up, you know, over the years. And then this is now like, obviously like the apex species to go after. And, and we've worked with them the whole way. So we know how they dive, you know, we know, that they understand the gear, but for someone new, um, it's super important to go through free dive training and safety. So like a level one free dive course is like kind of a must have just so that you know how to enter the water, the, the Wahoo in particular, are just so finicky and they've been pressured in the upper keys really hard, you know? So like if you enter the water wrong, you could spook them away a lot of times, or if you can't hold your breath, long enough with a certain school, they might stay 30 feet away. But if you're down there hanging for a minute and a half, two minutes, they might come right up to you and that you might only be 15 feet below the surface, but it's going to take some time. Um, generally folks that, you know, if they don't have their own free diving fins or their own equipment or, or they don't want to travel with that's usually indication that they're a little bit newer. Um, and like, well, I never want to turn anybody away, but I also want to make sure that, that they don't get turned off from the sport. They don't get overwhelmed in the water. And there's, it's like a tough feeling, you know, when you have a school of fish come through and you're like, there they are. And the diver's not ready or something like that. And for me, it makes no, doesn't make a difference. I want the diver to be successful, but I also don't want to turn them away from one of the most amazing hunts that they'll ever have, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, just having their own equipment, having some time in the water, having a couple fish under their belt and have, you know, being used to their equipment's the biggest thing. Like spear guns don't have sights on them. So if you haven't shot the blue water guns before, that's going to be a big, a big trick yeah. to kind of get through. Yeah. What about the, um, the status of the lionfish? Uh, last time we had you on the, the podcast, we talked primarily about the lionfish. You do a lot of that and, and you're obviously very good at it. If you look at your Instagram, you'll have the entire boat full of these things. What What's yeah. going on with the lionfish these days? Have we noticed any change whatsoever in the population? So lionfish, um, still invasive, still tons of them, but their numbers, in my opinion, are going way down. Oh. Uh, the Yeah, the derbies have been doing a great job and just the awareness is, is, I mean, everybody now knows about them. Everybody knows how good they are. There's industries built around them. The conservation efforts, like we've been, just been doing so much. Uh, we've actually been doing a lot of uh, research with uh, Reef Environmental Education Foundation. They put the tournaments on and a bunch of other nonprofits are just like so excited about lionfish. They got people diving in submarines trying to figure out like, okay, they start here, they move here. So we've been doing a lot of that, but like our last derby, um, I think we got just over 400 for two days of really long, tough diving. I mean, we really worked hard for them. And then the derby before that, we got, uh, just over 570 in a day. Wow. And so that's just you, your boat. You yeah. Just right? one boat for so, us. And yeah. how many boats would be in, in a, in a derby like that? So I think the last, uh, I'd have to, I think it was like 14 teams. So, so 14, there could 14 be boats, thousands and thousands of, is there a, do you, do they, have, I'm sure they have a, a head count of total, uh, out, yeah. of, out of one yeah. of these, these derbies. How many, I mean, are we talking, we're talking thousands and thousands of them, right? Well, the, well, the, so there's a couple different ones. The one in the Florida Keys, there's two. Those are the two derbies that we do. Um, and I think we, like the last tournament, I think we shot about a third of them between all the teams. So, uh, but we we really, I mean, we charter for it. So we really understand the lionfish very well. We kind of know what habitat they like. And, we, and, and on top of that, like we put in a lot of effort. You know, we're extremely dialed in. Like, when it comes to preparation for a lionfish tournament, like I'd probably put more into that than my running my marathon. Wow. <laughs> I mean, we like it's every spot is, is played out. We have all the different tank mixes that we're diving. So we're, you know, we're mainly on the reef ledge, but I mean, everything is dialed down to the minute. Um, and we got backup plans for backup plans. So we put a lot of effort in at, at doing it for sure. Yeah. But, but that's it's it's interesting to me that that you feel like the numbers are going down because at some point at one point you know we were talking to to different people and they're like I don't think we're I don't think they're ever gonna I don't think we're ever gonna get rid of these things we may not get rid of them but 
you know, it also looked like they were they were like reproducing faster than they were being eliminated, I guess. And so it's it's very refreshing to hear somebody that spends as much time at as it as you do to think that the numbers have gone down, even if it's slightly. Well, yeah, we, I mean, I've definitely noticed it. I mean, just for charters alone, just like someone books a lionfish charter, like we used to years ago, we would shoot, you know, 30 to 50 on charter for someone just doing four dives in a day. I mean, that was like an easy average. And now I'd say we're more in like that 15 to 20 fish range Hmm. would be like your estimated what we actually get on the boat. We see more, but you know, sometimes they're harder, you know, don't actually get all of them. You know, some of the smaller ones are hard to bring up. Um, but I would say too, these fish have been in the keys now for a while in the Caribbean. So, I mean, just in our Marina, when we're flying, I'm like the manatees are eating them, yeah. which is inter- interesting. So weird, isn't eating it? Them. Yeah. They just gnaw on them, you know? So, and then I've, I have noticed too, we, we mainly dive on the reef. Now we used to dive a lot of little wrecks and stuff, but as Goliath groupers really come back, I mean, there's, I don't think that there's any official evidence of this, but we've, I've seen a huge correlation between those larger, uh, groupers, like where we see like Goliath groupers or large black groupers on a spot. Um, we don't see a lot of lionfish there. And then when we go to a spot that doesn't have any Goliath groupers, we see a lot of lionfish. So well, it would make complete I sense. I be, mean, a Goliath yeah. grouper can eat about anything it wants to. Um, and it yeah. would make sense that they do, but you, you haven't seen one just eat a free swimming lionfish ever. No. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. But we have, we did do some work with reef and we had GoPros down and we were doing like hydrophone work, which was really interesting. Like trying to play back a lionfish sound, like a call basically, and see if we could call lionfish in. And that was funny, interesting study we did with them. We actually had a lionfish that, uh, like, like swam away and hid when a nerf shark came close to it. Really? So, so, and I would say lionfish too, are like they're starting to swim away when we approach them. Mm. So just like, just like Wahoo do like Wahoo are starting to avoid divers. In my opinion, I've noticed that. And I've seen the same for some larger lionfish that have been through the process. You know, maybe they've survived a tournament or two and they're now seeing us as predators. So they're starting to hide. Yeah. So I think that's an indication that some there are some sharks and some groupers that are starting to eat these things. Yeah, I saw a, a video. It went around um, Instagram, and a guy shot one, and a mutton snapper came over and he pulled it off the the spear, and it's just kind of floating there. And the mutton snapper ate it. And uh, I, I, that was going to be one of my questions for you today: is if 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 you're noticing any predation on the on the lionfish, because that would obviously you know, we can yeah. kill them. All we, we see want, that a lot. Yeah. yeah. We see that a lot. So, so if you, if you shoot a lionfish, like some of the smaller ones, mm-hmm. you know, we'll, we'll kill them and then we'll shoot them. We'll just leave them on the reef and uh, eels immediately are on top of them. Mm. Like we've had, we've had eels, like they lionfish will be sitting next to a coral and the eel will just sit there and wait for us to shoot it. Mm. But so I, I think that as long as lionfish is dead, I think then the, the predator would be like, okay, well, I don't have to exert energy to hunt this fish. So now it's worth it versus at what point does it switch where I'm going to exert energy to hunt this fish? Yeah. I think that's what we're starting. I haven't like really seen it, but I've, I've just noticed where we have large predators like Goliath grouper. I have noticed that there are very few lionfish, if any, on those spots. Yeah. And so, what about your opinion of, of the population of the Goliath grouper? Has it grown shrunk? Do you notice any difference? Well, we did, well, we did, a th- we did, we spent three days scouting. Um, well, one thing with the tur- lionfish tournaments, we do a lot of scouting. So, uh, the one tournament we can hunt anywhere. It's not just the keys. We can go in the golf. You can go to the Bahamas, wherever you want. So I'm like, all right, let's try to get a thousand fish. <laughs> we want to get a bunch. So we have a bunch of spots in the golf and we wanted to go take inventory of the lionfish. Cause a couple of these spots, you know, used to have like 300 plus lionfish on one area. And we spent three days looking and some of the spots, I mean, there was like 50 to 70 adult size Goliath group around these spots. Mm-hmm. And like a couple like two years ago, didn't see that. Wow. So it was, and then on the reef, I would say the healthier reefs that we have in the keys, meaning like really nice, strong relief where we see a lot of bait. Like if you're fishing there, like speedos and ballyhoo will come up, um, where the yellow tail's good, you know, all that stuff. We, 
if we're doing a drift dive on scuba, which is like 30 minutes where I generally see at least one to four Goliath grouper per spot. Hmm. So, which is you look at like two years ago, we maybe see one a day if yeah. that on the reef. So yeah. there, there are, yeah, we are starting to see quite a few of them. So, sure. you know, the, the, there's been a lot of um, discussion between fishermen, divers, you know, that, that have a different kind of opinion. A lot of the fishermen believe that there's too many Goliath groupers um, and, and they're going to wrecks that they used to catch all different kinds of fish. And basically it's a hundred percent Goliath groupers and there's nothing else there. So the fishermen in a lot of cases are not crazy about them, feel like they, you know, should have a season on them in some way, shape or form. But a lot of the, the, the divers might feel a little bit differently because you take somebody down there and there's these giant fish that they can look at and it's really, really awesome. Um, you know, and it makes, makes your day like, wow, there's a 300 pound Goliath grouper right there. That's pretty cool. And if somebody's never seen that before and you're taking them diving, then that might be a different opinion than the person that's fishing on the surface might have because they, they're not getting any fish up to the surface because they're all getting eaten by Goliath groupers or sharks. So just wondered kind of what your, what your opinion is there. Um, do you like having a lot of the Goliath groupers around for the sake of showing people the Goliath groupers, or do you feel as though they're uh, having an impact on the other fish that maybe you, you spearfish for or like to see in the water? Yeah. Well, I mean, I like seeing, I would like to see 130 pound black grouper on my dives, but there's an <laughs> yeah. open season for them. Right. Know? So, I mean, they're, be they're beautiful too. I mean, uh, Goliath grouper has been closed for a long time, protected. And I mean, if, if numbers are coming back to support a season, like FWC opened up a lottery, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody should be excited about that. That means that the research is showing, right. That, that that's a success story. Yeah. You know, just like red snapper. I mean, the season's small, but at least you're able to take some. So, you know, if, the, if you're able to take 200 Goliath grouper out of certain areas, like that's a success story for a, for a species. Um, but what I would say is like coming from, I, cause we fish and dive. I mean, they are kind of annoying, same, same as bull sharks and stuff. It's, it's, you know, you, so if you're on a good yellowtail bite and you lose a couple of sharks and you have to work four times as harder, you got to move, you know, you don't want to be losing fish, but the sharks are very smart. And so they're Goliath grouper. Um, like on the wrecks, a couple popular ones that we see them like the Eagle, the Duane, the bib are all very common wrecks to dive and spearfish on for the community. Um, those Goliath groupers, if you're holding a spear gun, they will just follow you. Hmm. So, so same as like when you're on the reef fishing a spot, like I said, that has good yellowtail, good bait, you know, a lot of those fish are like when we yellowtail snapper fish, and then we free dive after a lot of times we do like combo trips. When we get in the water and go down, there's a couple of Goliath grouper and bull sharks sitting right underneath the boat. Yeah. So I wouldn't say so much that I think the problem is more is that they're just smart fish. They're old smart fish. And they know it's like, okay, well I'm going to hang underneath this thing because there's a yellow tail or grouper that is dangling from a line, having a hard time getting to the bottom and it's easy for me to grab it. Right you know, and same with the sharks. I mean, how many times have you fished and you see like there's a shark underneath the boat and you get the fish close and he won't goes out and grabs it. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, so, but it does seem that it's happening a lot more and in certain areas that, you know, maybe there were one or two sharks. Now it's just so many that you just, you just have to move. I mean, it's like we have no chance of, of catching anything here you know, maybe, yeah. maybe you can catch the first one or two, but then after that, everything's getting eaten. And, yeah. you know, it's a, you have an ethical responsibility, I think, as a, as a, as an angler, you can't just keep feeding them. You have to, no, you move. Have to move. And, yeah. you know, for you a guide, you found this great spot and now you got to move and go find another one. Just like you said, it's five times harder than, you know, than it, than it was at one point, because you could just go to that spot and sit on it uh, and catch your limit and move on. But I don't know. I, I, th I think that definitely, you know, I've talked about this with a bunch of different people, but I think that it's entirely possible that, you know, you have the shark advocates that are, uh, are all, you know, concerned about the overall shark population. And, you know, maybe the overall shark population in the, in the world could possibly be going down, but you could have certain areas where it's exploding, you know, like in the, I think in the Florida Keys, I think there's more than, than ever before. And I'm looking at it from I the agree. surface. Yep. You're looking at it from under the surface. I'd be, you know, interested in what you think. You, you say you agree that there's more than, more than you maybe more than I've ever seen in my fishing career. 
and it just seems yep. like there's more every year. Um, I, I have too. Yeah. For, for diving. Yeah. Um, and it's gotta but be I, I even more, it, <laughs> more, uh, unnerving for the diving. I mean, you're actually in there with these things, uh, rather than on top of, on top of the water in a safe boat. That's, that's a big difference. Uh, you, your opinion, yeah. <laughs> your opinion is stronger than, than mine of, yeah, they're there. I know they're there. <laughs> I saw them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I yeah. think, I think well, there's I, just a lot more. Well, I think a big part of it too is, is, I wish that there was a uh, more time spent on data supporting all, all aspects of it. So, I mean, there's a lot more Goliath grouper and sharks. I mean, we, uh, if, if you, if you don't agree with that, I mean, you got to spend more time on a boat because mm -hmm. they're there yeah. and there's a lot more than there used to be. And they're very smart and they're learning. And that's the problem is like, yeah, there's more of them, but now they have, they know boat engines. They know what chum behind the boat means. And even if you're just tuna fishing on a wreck, like they, they will specifically weigh. It's like every large tuna you get that you can't get up quick. They, a lot of the time the shark will get it. So, um, I think just more time and research needs to be put into it to really understand it. I, I don't, I mean, th there's certain areas in the keys that for sure, I think that there's too many on, on spots, Yeah, but hard to know what the answer is, you know, like, like, um, I like the, 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 the idea of opening the Goliath grouper season and, and it's interesting that they did it with small fish, um, as opposed to, to, to big ones. Um, but you know, I, I had a, a conversation with the FWC. I think it was FWC that we had on the podcast. Was it? Yeah. And, and I was actually quite surprised that they opened the season because one of the things that I never thought about as an angler is that, you know, you have to have. Uh, data or, or, or generally in, in a lot of situations, you need data to make a decision on whether you should open a season or close a season or how many or how big or, or whatever. And with the Goliath grouper, it's been closed so long that there's no catch data. And yeah, yet they, that's a good, yeah. yet they opened a season anyway, because you can have data with your, with your eyes and data with, you know, they're talking to divers, they're talking to fishermen, they're saying there's more than we've ever seen before. And they, they went ahead and opened a season despite not having much data. And now with these 200, I'm sure that if they issue 200 permits, 200 people are going to satisfy, they're going to fill that tag. I'm sure. And I mean, yeah, it would Depending be on very hard, permit, right? Yeah. But I mean, even <laughs> it's like, if you, if you're trying to catch Goliath grouper to kill, this is the best time in history. Like it, yep. there's, there's so many, and I would be yep. surprised if somebody went out there and tried one or two or three times and didn't get one that was of the right size to, to take. Yeah. Well, would, well, and, and to be honest, I mean, when we did the three days of scouting for that tournament, I mean, we saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grouper on spots that are tiny in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, um, like the amount of Goliath grouper that we saw was just, I mean, it was beautiful to see. It was really special. It was really breathtaking to see that many big fish all at once. But I mean, they like to see how many was, it was quite phenomenal. Um, but I think that what you're saying is it, that's what goes for the keys too, is that there's just no catch data on mm -hmm. Goliath grouper. And that's, that's a missing piece. So I don't, I don't think it's fair to say one way or the other, we just more energy needs to be put into it. And of course, if they were to open up like a limited season in the keys, I mean, that would be a success story. Sure. And that's, oh, absolutely. that's everybody, that's everybody's goal. Nobody wants to see, you know, your limit go down or seasons to get shorter. If, if it's, if it's working, you know, we should see people to be able to harvest them. Yeah. And that that's, that's the goal. Right. So, and that's their goal too. Like the, the FWC, yeah. they're not the enemy. They're just the enforcement, right? Like they, right. and then whoever makes these, these, uh, these choices of seasons and, and size limits and all that stuff, it's, it's all, you know, supposedly based upon scientific data to the best of our ability or their ability to make whatever law is necessary. And it's in, in, I love what you're saying that when you see a season open, or extended or a size limit increased, that's success. That is a huge right, success right. story. And and that's what we, right. we should all want that, you know, to, to see that next year there's 400 permits. And next year after that, there's 2,500 permits, you know, right. for, for larger size fish, that would be the best. And then you get the catch data that starts to support that decision. Is this a good decision? Are there plenty there? 
um, maybe you determine that you can catch a lot more or a lot less. I don't know, but yeah. it's just kind of an interesting deal. And it's, it's certainly uh, cool to, to, you know, you may spend a ton of time on the water and that is, that's a different experience than a ton of time in the water like you're doing. Right. And uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's just interesting. I always find it uh, kind of cool to talk to my, my diving friends and just, you know, talk about spots that we both know in a different way. And like, this is what I do there and this is what they do there. And like, what do you actually see in the water there? And, and, and you can learn a ton. And, and of course, somebody that only spends their time on the, on, on the surface of the water and in a boat could learn a ton by getting in the water and looking around. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot. I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of fun talking to captains down here and, and, uh, you know, friends that just charter fish, get them in, like, especially scuba diving, just like, cause they like, here, let's go. This is your spot let's go dive it so you can see what you got going on right. here. And they'll be like, Oh, it makes sense. And like some of the deep fads and wrecks and stuff that are here too. I'm like, Oh yeah, well that's what this is. And they're like, Oh, well that makes sense. Why I lose my group around this spot because they go into the, I'm like, yeah, they go into this thing. So it helps them all out. And like one last note on the Goliath grouper stuff is I, I would just say like, there's nothing easy about making these decisions. And I've learned that from a number of seminars I've gone to with, with no, with no fisheries. I'm, I'm, really enjoy fisheries management as a whole. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's, there's nothing easy about trying to collect data and try to predict, you know, outcomes and stuff. So, I mean, it takes time. And I think the more people cooperate or just to open to changes and the idea of, of it, and the more they're willing to like help out with the data, I think that will all be better for everyone, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the Goliath grouper is a great, great, um, example of that with no data there's no chance you know for a long time there was no chance that they were going to make any decision on it and you know it's probably public outcry that that you know made them really look hard at this and say you know what would taking 200 fish look like you know right. to me i think i think that shows open mindedness and um an ability to to make a decision you know despite the data which which i thought was pretty good you know, and then yeah. hopefully this, this will open the door for more data, um, and, and open the door for, for a, a season of some sort on larger fish, yeah. because that seems like I mean, there's a lot of little ones, but there are a lot of big ones. I mean, oh, yeah. and they're the ones that eat so much. I mean, those yeah. things, they're incredible. Um, Tony, that's awesome, man. I love hearing about the elk hunting and the marathoning. It's, it's awesome. It's great to catch up with you again. Um, if somebody wanted to go with you, what would they, what would they do? Yep. So you can check me out on Instagram, Captain Tony Young. Um, you can check out our website, diveyoung.com. Um, we're on Facebook as well, or just give me a call. My number is 305-680-8879. But uh, yeah, just just hit us up and we'd love to spend some time with you on the water for sure. Okay. All right. You should definitely do that. Tony's a good dude. All right. That's it yeah. for today. We'll be back next week with uh, another awesome guest. See you.